Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matters series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basurto and I am a current senior um, at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York. I am also the intern um, for the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum this year and I will be facilitating the series of 28 presentations that will, will be released throughout the month of February in 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. I will now lead you through some introductory statements. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York. In the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nehoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nehoff has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York, to create the Black History Matters series. The following statement is the purpose of Black History Matters, and you can see it on the screen. Nehoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality <clears throat> given the resonance with Nehoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nehoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protests due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehoff will present Black History Matters, a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history in February of 2021. Now, thank you so much for joining me on this presentation where we will be talking about the Wilmington insurrection. So like myself, many of you probably spent January 6, 2021 in shock, watching your TVs and wondering how we came to this moment. A moment that would end years of the hallowed tradition of a peaceful transfer of power in the United States and that would forever mark the history of our nation. I found myself glued to the computer, watching a live stream of the events and unconsciously understanding the severity and uniqueness of the moment. Here was undeniable proof of an attempted insurrection. Here was a first in American history. But to my surprise, I soon learned that this attempt at an insurrection or a coup d'etat as some have called it, was actually not at all unique or unprecedented in our history. In fact, <clears throat> as often happens after moments of historical importance, social media was brimming with facts about an event known as the Wilmington Insurrection of 1898 or the Wilmington Massacre of 1898 or even the Wilmington Coup of 1898. The event goes by many names because it was all of those at the same time. It is now known as the only successful coup d'etat to have happened on American soil. I became enthralled with this event and spent days following the Capitol riots, researching and trying to understand how, in a country so adamant on its ideals of democracy, an insurrection could have taken place and succeeded. The Wilmington insurrection remains unique in our history, however, the events of January 6, 2021 should demonstrate to us all how delicate our democracy really is. So I'll give you a brief overview of what happened on 1898 um, by summarizing the events, but I will also go back in, in some history and give context to how the Wilmington insurrection came about. So on Thursday, November 10th, 1898, a mob of white supremacists overthrew a duly elected biracial government in Wilmington, North Carolina. The mob had been incited by Southern Democrats, the same party that had led the South into secession after the election of Abraham Lincoln. The mob numbered around 2,000 white men and destroyed Black people's properties, businesses, and the only Black newspaper in town. 
They also killed somewhere around 60 to 300 people and ran out of town the black and white political leaders who had just been elected as a part of the fusionist government. Now I'd like to give you some background on the fusionist government itself um, because it speaks to how this type of government came about and why it was so adamantly opposed by the Southern Democrats. So st to start off, the fusionist government in North Carolina was a cross-racial coalition consisting of Black Republicans and white members of the Populist Party who collaborated in state elections in the last decade of the 19th century. So this fusion was largely successful in the 1890s. The coalition managed to gain power in the state's General Assembly, the state's executive offices, and the state Supreme Court. Many of those voted into office were actually Black Republicans. The rest of this party's coalition um, was the Populist Party. And this coalition was so successful because poor white cotton farmers had turned on the Democratic Party and formed the basis of the People's Party, otherwise known as the Populist Party. This was because the economic depression of 1892 and general dissatisfaction with capitalism, represented by big banks and railroad companies, had made poor white farmers ally themselves with Blacks who they largely saw sharing their hardships. Thus, the birth of the fusion, fusion coalition. Um, black, uh, black people, especially recently freed men and freed women, I'm not freed women, sorry, only freed men, on their part voted Republican because that was the party that had emancipated them and was also working to grant them rights, such as some reconstruction policies like uh, suffrage for black men. I also want to give you some background on the demographics of Wilmington itself <clears throat> to give a little bit more context as to how this um, how this insurrection came to take place and how the fusionist government came to have power in Wilmington itself. So in the 1860s, just before the beginning of the Civil War, the city of Wilmington was both the largest city in North Carolina and also was a majority Black city. The enslaved Black population in the city worked a variety of different jobs, but due to the nature of the city, their main occupations were typically working at city ports, working as domestic servants in households, and artisans and skilled laborers. These occupations will likely um, have been shared by the free Black population also living in Wilmington. Decades after the Civil War, with emancipation and the beginning and end of Reconstruction, Wilmington was still the largest city in the state and continued to have a majority Black population. This was not only keeping in trends with the pre-Civil War population, but also was caused by the migration of freed men and women into the city um, as they were looking for work after emancipation and, not, and also looking for uh, a chance to build communities of Black people away from the oppression of white people that they would experience in the plantations had they not moved. This community would grant them a degree of safety. The migration was also meant, um, also meant that Wilmington was now experiencing a growth of a black middle class, as well as experiencing the presence of multiple black professionals and businesses. Tensions grew with the influx of black migrants as it always does whenever large amounts of people move into a place in a short period of time. I will also be covering the great migration later in the series and that movement certainly speaks to the creation of tensions. So these tensions that I'm speaking about were dangerous because they created resentment among Southern Democrats who began to join groups like the KKK and the Red Shirts, both white supremacist groups that terrorized black communities across the South and even before the end of reconstruction, but certainly afterwards as well. And we will see that the Red Shirts were actually also part of the Wilmington insurrection. The joining of these groups like the KKK and the Red Shirts was caused by white resent resentment at the growing political and economic power of black people in the South, but also policies that restricted Confederate veterans from voting and holding public office, as well as in general, the defeat of the Confederacy and what was seen as the occupation by the North, because certainly a lot of these people that had fought in the Confederacy were still alive and experiencing the reconstruction era. The rights of black people were also being increasingly cemented as the passing of Reconstruction Acts like the 14th and 15th Amendments, which were ratified in North Carolina in this period, um, protected the rights of Black people, if at least on paper, because 
their rights were continually suppressed anyways. Um, there was still a second form of slavery through chain gangs, but at least on paper, um, they would guarantee citizenship and the right to vote. Meaning that Republican rule in the South could still be guaranteed since black men tended to vote Republican and now they were given the ability to vote. Um, and, and this allowed this party to continue having a base by which they could be elected in the South. And that was particularly bad to certain Democrats. Now for the last contextualization, I want to speak a little bit about the, how the Wilmington insurrection itself occurred in the post reconstruction era and why this is important. So the end of reconstruction is typically dated to have ended around 1877 with President Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes compromise of 1877. I won't go much into detail about this. For that, I will refer you to the previous videos presented by Dr. Hogle on the, 13, on the three amendments of the reconstruction era, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. He speaks a lot about the context of the reconstruction era and the implementation of these amendments. And so I'll refer you to those videos. But basically, Southerners presented a lot of opposition to Northern reconstruction policies in the South, specifically attempts to ensure that Black people in the South could vote. Many of these reconstruction era policies were enacted only because the North had a military presence in the South during reconstruction and because of the presence of carpetbaggers who usually were interested in helping recently freed people as well. This military presence and the presence of um, carpetbaggers and people interested in, in the rights of freedmen um, meant that it was difficult for whites, particularly Southern Democrats of the South to deny Black Americans their rights recently obtained and bolstered by the Reconstruction Amendments. However, the Compromise of 1877 led to the pulling out of these troops from the South and leaving the South to decide for itself how it would solve the, quote, Negro problem. This effectively allowed certain states to begin violating the rights of Black people. With no one in their way, the groups such as the KKK and Red Shirts terrorized Black people at voting polls and won seats in government that would pass restricted voting laws that would ensure that Black people could not vote and thus fall into a perpetual cycle of oppression. I do want to emphasize though, that this violence predated even the end of reconstruction. Case in point, the Hamburg massacre, otherwise also known as the Red Shirt Massacre, is a key example of this type of violence even before the end of reconstruction. And the Hamburg massacre, which occurred in Hamburg, South Carolina in July of 1876, the Red, Shirt group, the Red Shirts group organized disturbances in majority Black Republican districts in hopes of limiting the votes cast by Black people by terrorizing them. This was in the lead up to the last election of the Reconstruction era, the 1876 election. A confrontation ensued between the Red Shirt group and Black servicemen of the National Guard located at the armory and ended with 100 white men attacking around 30 Black servicemen, killing two in the skirmish and an additional four later that night, as well as wounding several others, other servicemen. In total, the events in Hamburg resulted in death and the death of one white man and six black men, with several more blacks being wounded. Although 94 white men were indicted for murder by the coroner's jury, none were prosecuted for their crimes. And instead, this type of terrorism was allowed to go largely unopposed even while reconstruction was still going on. There were additional massacres in other parts of South Carolina leading up to the 1876 election. The Southern Democrats succeeded in taking control of the state government in 1876 and established a single party white rule that would disenfranchise black voters and, legal, and enact legal segregation laws through Jim Crow. This exclusion of blacks from political systems was effectively maintained into the 1960s with the beginning of the civil rights era. So they were largely effective in curtailing the rights for a very long time. So this kind of violence that we see in Wilmington is not new and is actually predated by white terrorism against black people, even going into the reconstruction era, uh, just following the civil war. So it's not surprising that these events happened in Wilmington. Following the 1898 insurrection in Wilmington, North Carolina, the influence of the fusionist coalition fell apart as Democrats took back control of the state legislature through the violent coup. The very next year, the Democrat controlled state legislator passed legislation that would disenfranchise most black people, um, most black men, 
and most poor whites. This meant that the base of the Republican and populist parties basically disappeared as individuals more likely to vote for these parties were no longer able to vote for a very long time. As I mentioned, poor whites tended to vote for the populist party, which had um, sided with the Republicans. This is a very similar story in various parts of the country, although none were as, quote, successful as Wilmington in overturning an, actually, an actual elected government as the coup of Wilmington did. But it is a history of white supremacy that is still alive and well. It is telling that in the Capitol riots that we saw on January 6th, the Confederate flag among, well, the Confederate flag was flown and images of a noose in front of the Capitol were shown. These are icons of terror and white supremacy and were being used to try to de delegitimize a duly elected government. So we can see that there's a lot of similarities between now and the coup of 1898. I want to end this presentation with a quote by Laura Edwards, who wrote in her book, Democracy Betrayed, the Wilmington Race Riot of 1898 and its Legacy. In it, she says, quote, what happened in Wilmington became an affirmation of white supremacy, not just in that one city, but in the South and in the nation as a whole, end quote. Therefore, I think an acknowledgement of our history and white supremacy is needed to cope with what we saw happen in 2021 on January 6th, which is not so distant or distinct from what we saw happen in Wilmington in 1898. So thank you so much for joining me on that presentation. This was something that I thought was very relevant to the moment and would help us understand the severity and the importance of how we remember January 6, 2021 in the years going forward um, as we continue to learn more about the event itself. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I have provided a reference list of sources with websites that you can explore to learn more in the video description. I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey linked beneath the video in that same video description which will help us gather feedback about this specific topic. This survey will take you no more than five minutes to fill out and will provide us with valuable information that will help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, feel free to email me at the email address provided on the screen um, and you may contact me with any questions or comments. Additionally, please do contact Nehoff with any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work, Nehoff's contact information is located on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank you so much for joining me in this presentation. Um, just remember that we will be releasing a new presentation each day this February of 2021, and I look forward to seeing you at our next presentations. Thank you. <laughs>